how are we going to work together? How are we going to make decisions? Who's going to own what decisions? How are we going to resolve conflict? How should we push back if we disagree with each other? What happens when we get to a certain point and we want to go in different directions? One of the most common strategies to build a business is by having a partner. And sometimes having a partner can be really helpful and sometimes it really gets you into a bit of trouble if you haven't figured out how to have that working relationship. So in this podcast, we're going to talk about how you make business partnerships work. Joining me today is Dr. Jeff Kaplan. He's Leadership Coach of the Year for 2022 by CEO Today Magazine. Jeff, welcome to today's discussion. Thanks, Raj. Great to be here. Let's talk about how you start these partnerships. I know there's lots of things that can come up. People might have a partnership with business, uh, a business, a friend. It could be acquaintance, could be a college buddy, that kind of thing. So what are some of the things that people really need to pay attention to before they get into business? And then we're going to talk about what happens if you've already done it and you're listening to this podcast. <laughs> what can you do to fix things? That's great. I mean, you know, when you think about how businesses get started, right? Particularly like young businesses and particularly people that have not been in business before. You know, usually it's like, you know, you hear like, you know, p people feel twi fail twice before they, the third time, right? It's because like, it's like a relationship, right? When you're in, you know, whatever, high school or college, you, you know, you go through those early relationships to help you realize what, um, <laughs> what not to do, right? And maybe what to do. And so hopefully with this podcast, we can, you know, kind of uh, stack the deck, right? Um, but but when, when, when people come together and, and are talking about a business, usually they're excited about the idea and the possibilities, right? Um, and what they often don't talk about is the relationship. Like, how are we going to work together? How are we going to make decisions? Who's going to own what decisions? How are we going to resolve conflict? How should we push back if we disagree with each other, right? What happens when we get to a certain point and we want to go in different directions, right? And so, you know, you know and I know, uh, you know, an operating agreement is only going to take you so far, right? But, you know, and, and so I'll, I'll lead with this. It starts with trust, right? And so um, I would ask, like, how much do you trust each other, right? And, um, and, you know, it's like a lawyer once said to me, like, you know, with, um, without trust, no legal agreement is um, going to necessarily keep you from court kind of thing. And with trust, you almost don't need it. You do need mm -hmm. it, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, what kind of issues? You talked about a few of them, you know, uh, scenarios that a lot of people don't foresee. Uh, so having an operating agreement, great. If you've got the foresight to have that knocked out, wonderful. But, uh, but let's, say, let's say you didn't put any specific stipulations in the operating agreement, and now you've got a business relationship that you're trying to take forward. I know from personal experience, I've seen situations where sometimes one person in the partnership outpaces the capacity to do certain types of work than the other one. Uh, maybe you even have different roles, uh, but sometimes people just move at different speeds uh, and the other person can't quite keep up and maybe they still have 50% of the partnership. How do you have these dialogues when one person is just doing more work than the other person? Well, so what I would hope is that before you got to that point, you talked about how do we want to deal with conflict, right? You know, and, and slash disagreement. Mm -hmm. And so one of my isms is to have the conversation about the conversation before you have the conversation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Let's go a little bit deeper into yeah, that. Yeah, what does it mean? Uh, yeah. Right? And so having the conversation about the conversation before you have the conversation is, it means what's the process, the structure um, that you're going to use to, um, uh, before you have that difficult conversation. So an example. So um, I started a business um, in 2006, and there was three founders, um, and uh, eventually, me and one of the other uh, partners um, had some pretty major conflict. And um, I'm, you know, this is what I do, right? So I'm all ready to, like, you know, let's work through this. Well, um, he was not uh, emotionally aware enough to be able to do that, right? And so um, we came up with a strategy where one of us would send an email, the subject would be Channel B. Um, which meant like, um, like 
separating out conversations around the business and kind of talk about like what's happening. Right. And I mean, it seems so silly. It was instrumental for him because while I was able to be, you know, kind of fluid around kind of, we are part of, we are the business. Like this is the business. Um, that separation of just saying, okay, I'm going to prepare myself, you know, to say, you know, why, what's working and what's not working um, here. Right? And j let me just say one other thing. So as simple as when you do X or when you said X, the impact on me was Y. And then making a request, you know, could you X, but creating a time and a space to have that conversation. So <clears throat> have a conversation with your partner and just basically tell them how you're feeling? It's what you're thinking, what you're feeling, and you can start there. But so here's what I say about conflict or disagreement, right? So using your example, one person's accelerating and the other person seems to be kind of stuck, right? One possibility that obviously comes to mind is like, you know, maybe this person is... Um, the person that's stuck is kind of like they're on the wrong role, right? They're, you know, when you're starting a business, like everybody's mm -hmm. doing everything. Um, but at the end of the day, we have certain capabilities, right? And so I would say early on, have a conversation specifically that says, what do we want to do when roles and responsibilities are no longer working? Because mm -hmm. if we are successful, whatever we have now that's working what's going to be needed is going to change and we may or may we may not individually and collectively have that confidence so let's talk now about you know how will we decide about bringing other people in how will we decide about reshifting our responsibilities do we want to lock in our um our uh kind of distributions um, in terms of profits, in terms of value and how we want to define value. So just, you know, just beginning to raise those kinds of questions ahead of time. <clears throat> you know, one of the things, uh, one of the mistakes I see small business make very frequently is they hand out titles a little bit too freely, yeah. especially at the very young stages. So, yeah. for example, if you have somebody who is... Um, uh, managing marketing and you make them VP of marketing or chief marketing officer. And they're really just kind of, I mean, at a true corporate sense, they might even be like a, a lower level manager or something, but now they've got this big title. And as your company grows, they haven't really had the experience to be able to blossom into what a true VP of marketing might need to do. And you need to bring somebody like that in. Well, now you've already capped out the title. Right. So until you shift that person's title to something, I hate to say it, something a little bit lower, yeah. then bringing someone on at the level that you actually need is going to be pretty hard. So what I strongly recommend to startups is be very conservative with the titles. If you need to give somebody a title like a manager, uh, but maybe maybe they want to be a little bit higher, call them a director. Because you can have multiple directors, you can then hire a senior director, you can hire, but make him a director, don't make him a VP, don't make him a chief something or other. That's dangerous. Yeah, you know, entrepreneur, you know, so, so there's businesses today that, like, they don't have titles. <laughs> um, you know, and there's a different philosophy about that, right? Like, I think, particularly as you get larger, I think titles are helpful because they help other people, they provide a frame of reference for other people to have a sense of what you do and and it quite frankly it does uh it does spell out certain authority around decision making i mean one of the things that often goes very wrong in new businesses and quite frankly established ones is uh decision making well whose decision is this and in startups it's like everything is by consensus well that's a headache. <laughs> yeah, um, should yeah. everything really be by consensus? Yeah, leading by consensus, uh, it takes you only so far. It can get you in a really, it can get you stuck really fast. 
Yeah, uh, big decisions, great. You know, to yeah. sell the company, not to sell the company. You know, mm -hmm. there's only two or three founders. Mm -hmm. But you know, so so this going, this is all about you know t tying into the roles and responsibilities. So um, there's a there's a there's a model of um, to think about that I think are real, is really helpful when you're starting a company, e even when you're just starting a project, or when things have gone awry. Uh, to go back and look at this, even if you've not done it at the beginning, and it's the GRPI model, right? And so, you know, think of a, a triangle, uh, like a like a triangle, t t t the tip at the top, you know. So, and then uh, segment it uh, horizontally. So you have goals at the top, then you have roles and responsibilities, then you have processes, I mean, processes and strategies, procedures, and then you have like the I is the interpersonal stuff. And so, a lot of times when we see conflict, when we see in early businesses and again established ones where there's a lot of conflict between people they go right to like bob's the problem right they go right mm -hmm. to the interpersonal stuff mm -hmm. and i'm not saying bob might not be a problem but you know or it might not be pe it might be people's stuff but oftentimes like it you, you need to back up it starts with well wait a second what are we trying to do here like first of all do we still do we have are we aligned on the vision of where we're trying to take this new company um, but all right, so so let's say we are. But what are our goals? What are our priorities for the year? How are we going to measure success? Right? How are we going to define it? Right? And then once you've established what the goals are, and then you make sure that there's alignment on that, then you look at roles and responsibilities. Okay, well, who owns what? Right? Okay, so you talked about marketing, Raj. So all right, so if you you're going to own marketing right now, then then you know we might have all we might decide that everybody should have input into marketing and branding but you own marketing so at the end of the day the final decision is yours so we give you input but then you know you have the authority uh to to, to roll that out so making sure and this is quite frankly right this is where i see a lot of the um issues in, in companies is like they have ill-defined roles and responsibilities particularly today and just to finish this up then the next thing is how processes and, and, and strategies for example how are we going to make decisions right how are we going to um you know what process what procedures are we going to use not just for decision making but for growing the company that kind of thing and then finally is the interpersonal stuff so there's there's clearly a lot that can happen inside uh, this business relationship. I mean, it's not just stuff that maybe one's capacity is limited. It could be just some, there's some stuff going on in that other person's life, you know. And so, to your point about operating agreements, let's say one of your partners is is having a, a domestic issue. Maybe they're getting divorced. Maybe their spouse got a job somewhere else and they need to move uh, as a family. And so that leaves you to kind of like figure out what what happens next. A lot of these things need to be talked about up front when you're in that nascent stage. And even if you haven't put that together in your current operating agreement when you form the company, you can still do a little bit of an update afterwards. You can you can have these conversations. It's important to have things like uh, you know, like a buy sell agreement perhaps. You know what happens if uh, if if you move and you're not able to take care. Of, what if you know what if we're not making enough money? And you need to get another job, but I don't need another job, and I can keep going. So you know the amount of work each of us is putting in uh, should be proportioned. All those things have to be at least discussed. Yes. So what I would say is, at the very beginning, you co-create the working alliance, and you come up with a set of questions um, that you both agree to, um, you know, to talk about. And I'm just going to give you some examples. What excites you about this partnership? What worries you about this partnership? Right? What does work-life integration look like for you? Work, schedule, leave. You know what happens if you have a you know a situation like that, right? And in regard to that, how can I best support you? Right? Specifically, what do you want me to do or not do <laughs> to help make you know what you're doing for this company easy? And I this think, is these are questions that each partner is asking the other. Correct. Like you're having or, or, discussion. You're yeah. coming ahead of t ahead to the discussion, having already thought through the, 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 your responses to this, mm -hmm. right? But how do you like to communicate? For example, what do you really like to see in email communication? What doesn't work for you in email, right? What what's good for texting? What's good for phone? Um, what doesn't work for you on that, right? So um, you know, how do you get frustrated? How do you get stressed? Right? What, what 
um, what can I do? How, how's it going to show up, <laughs> right? And what, what can I do when that happens? Um, if we disagree, um, how do you want me to push back? Mm-hmm. I think I think that's a that's the biggest thing that creates uh, uh, ten, uh, tension inside a business relationship is when you disagree. And oftentimes it could be uh, big things like we disagree on strategic direction. And I've seen companies split apart where they just can't work together because one person wants one thing for the company, the other wants another thing for the company. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, have, I mean, having that discussion up front will take you so far. <laughs> but, but what about things like... Um, uh, someone just handles marketing and they make all the decisions. Someone handles operations. Someone handles technology if you're a tech company or something. Uh, someone ha- handles customer success. Uh, what if one of the owners, one of the partners, feels like the other person isn't actually making the right decisions? And that's when the conflict arises. So first of all, there's a, so now I go, why not? Like, what's behind that, right? And so... He, here's a you know, secret, right? Stay away from judgment, <laughs> um, share observation, share impact, um, ask about intent, um, and then say, so, you know, w- you know, you've made this decision, this decision, this decision, we were here, our goal was here, here's we are. How do you think it's going, right? What do you think, you know, what do you think, you know, y- you or we are doing well? You know, where do you think you need to grow? How can I support you in that, right? So, um, so making an observation. Here's a, uh, in any sort of team environment, like somebody comes in from the outside, and you, you can sort of help raise awareness, right? But when you're stuck in it, and there's no one from the outside, just do these two things. One is just make an observation. So I've noticed that we haven't hit our marketing goals in, in this is the second quarter, uh, mm-hmm. you know, in a row. Or I've noticed that every time I start talking, you interrupt me. Right? Mm-hmm. Or I've noticed that in the last few weeks, we seem to be kind of circling around and not really making any progress. Right? So you, you share the observation, right? That's just data. That's an observation based on data, not judgment, right? Not you are lazy or, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> then you do one of two things after you make the observation. You either ask a question, what do you think about that? Like, where do you think we're stuck? What do you think we need to do right now? Um, Or you make a request. I'd like to request that we just, we take the rest of the day off and we come back tomorrow and we prepare to, we have a meeting and we prepare to share what we think is working in this collaboration and what's not working, and even better, we bring up some suggestions to improve it. Or I'm gonna, you know, my, you know, I, my request is that when I speak, um, you wait until I'm finished, and even better, that you're really trying to deeply understand what um, I'm saying before you sort of jump in, and please tell me if I'm not doing that for you. One of the things that I also see is when your company starts making some money and you start having resources to invest in some area. And so how do you decide, because this sometimes might feel like a consensus decision, but honestly, it really shouldn't be. It should be the CEO's decision. And you got to pick one of you or your partner. Somebody's got to be the CEO. Um, and uh, and it's not a coin flip. It should be the one that's really got the most awareness of uh, market potential, things like that. And so I think uh, that's an area I've seen companies really struggle because because if if I'm over here and I'm managing technology, I'm going to think the investment needs to go in technology. If I'm over here managing marketing, that's what I'm going to think. If I'm here managing sales, I'm going to think, oh well, no, we need to hire more salespeople. And so I'm going to think that's where the investment's got to go. How do you, if you have a business partner, make those types of decisions? Yeah, well, so two things. First of all, go back to the GRPI, right? What, what are the goals here that we're trying to achieve? Wh- who's, whose responsibility is this? Right? What processes do we agree that we're going to use? And then the interpersonal stuff. Um, however, what you're really pointing to, Raj, is the importance of doing 
the strategy work, right? Like, like what's our mission again, right? And what's our vision? Where are we trying to get to, right? Mm-hmm. And okay, wait, what, what did we say the strategy was for the next two years? And what are the priorities that we agreed to for this first six months, right? And by the way, what values did we agree on as a company that we're going to honor? Those values, by the way, are the way that you make decisions, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, your strategy, your priorities, the values, the mission, the vision, like that stuff, this is this is a great example of why that stuff is so important. If you haven't done that work, then you're just constantly at odds with each other and constantly while well, marketing wants the money over here and technology wants the money over here and R and D wants the money over here, right? That that should that conversation um, should be very rare if you've already done the other stuff. So it's also something in your business planning session, I think that's it's certainly worth an exercise uh, because if you're designing your business plan, you're figure basically a business plan is a roadmap. Here's what we could do in the next six months, 12 months. Exactly. And then after that, honestly, it's just hocus pocus. It's you know, two-year, five-year plans. I've, I see people try to like rack their brains thinking plan. about it. It's like, just <laughs> save it, save it. You don't need to do all that. Just just get a 12-month plan. When you're a startup, <laughs> you're good. And so... Um, so when it comes to, to building that roadmap, knowing ahead of time and discussing what you will invest in as you get the cash flow ahead of time, I think is, is, is pretty critical. And some of that really stems from where you can make the most money. It is a business. It's not a hobby. And I've found that uh, sometimes when I will take, I used to, I remember one time my, my team came to me and said, we need $200,000. It's like two hundred thousand is a lot of money, guys. What do <laughs> what do we need this for? And so they said, well, we need to invest in this software to help do X, Y, Z. It was like some special tools to right. blast our emails out at like just amazingly fast speeds. And so we looked at it. I was thinking, am I really going to get that ROI back, two hundred thousand dollars, or can I? Could would I be better off spending it somewhere else? And what ended up happening was they convinced me that we really need to invest in the technology because that $200,000 investment would actually save me half a million dollars in hiring staff to do effectively similar work. The technology would accelerate that. So I looked at that as a cost reduction measure by investing two hundred k as opposed to, oh, if I invest this, I'm going to make money. So I think there's lots of ways to look at it, but you got to, to me, it comes down to the money. Follow where the money's going to go. It's well, gonna save it. Right. Gonna save it. Well, so yeah, so uh, there all kinds of things you just raised, which I think are uh, w- you know worth worth addressing. So, you know, one is oftentimes, right? You know, like people come with a solution looking for a problem, right? You know, some salesperson convince them of the latest and yeah. greatest, and it sounds exciting, right? <gasps> That right. happens so well, often. exactly right. And so, what you oh. did as CEO <laughs> yeah. is you're like, okay, let's get clear. What's the problem to solve? What are the different ways to solve it? Right. Let's weigh out the pros and cons. What's the cost if we do? You know, not just the money, but like, you know, what's the cost? And are there more efficient, more effective, more, more cost-effective ways of solving it? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing, I, another thing that you pointed out that I want to give some light to is it's not about you. We are in service to the company. The company isn't there to serve you, right? And so stay focused yeah. on the greater good, right? The mission. That's what we're all here to do. So get out of your little, you know, but what about me space and remind yourself what the purpose of this company is and then, you know, put the clients in the center, put the mission in the center and put you off to the side. Yeah, I think that's a good reminder because far too often we lose our way uh, and the disputes end up becoming more about us than it is about the greater good, about the about the company. Uh, Jeff, thank you very much for this insightful conversation. I hope uh, anybody who is starting a business, who is running a business, who has a business partner, uh, gets a little bit out of it. Um, just one small other note. Sometimes you're in partnership with a family member. Uh, I was. I built my prior, my first two companies actually built with my brother, who uh, is an absolute technolo- technological genius. And uh, so we had very separated roles uh, where he took care of the technology and I didn't mess with him. He made those decisions. 
Uh, and then I did the marketing and the operations of the company. Uh, and so that was a pretty good thing too. But it is sometimes hard working with a family member. And so <laughs> I'll tell you one thing I always used to say is that we both report to the same mom and dad. And so we, we, we got to make it work out. <laughs> so, that's, so, that's yeah. Nice. That's great. Yeah, yeah, and we did. It's not like we didn't have any conflicts. We did. Sometimes we were just bashing our heads. No way. I can't believe you want to do it this way. What are you spending money on this for? Uh, but we've resolved it. Yeah, yeah. so the I talked about roles and responsibilities. The reasons that, and maybe future topic, right, for one of our podcasts, the reasons that family run businesses can be difficult is there's already, it's, it's, there's already an inherent role um, that exists. So now you have multiple relationships right like mm -hmm. we are not only whatever ceo and coo we are brother and sister or whatever it is and one relationship is there permanently you know unless like it's a spouse and you divorce um, yeah and i know several yeah i do see that and i know that um if you if you argue too much and you've got your feet just completely nailed to the ground without any flexibility it will rip apart your relationship it could rip apart your family it's like it's it's sad um one thing, Jeff, that you said was interesting, and that is you've already got a relationship going, uh, especially if you're siblings. One could be older, one could be younger. So there's already a dynamic that's already happened throughout your entire life. And if, for example, the younger one is actually a stronger CEO, that might be a little bit challenging for the older one to take that step back. I have seen that work really, really well. Um, I've seen... Uh, actually, Under Armour, Kevin Plank hired his brothers, uh, and he was the younger one, and you know, and and but he was the CEO. It was his idea and everything. He really took the company forward. Um, but his brothers were good with that because they knew the overall mission. So I think that's really what you want to. Uh, yeah, keep in here's mind. what I say. You know, earlier on, I talked about you know when you're starting a partnership, like what excites you about this partnership and what worries you about the partnership. So you're having the same conversation. Like, look, we've known each other our whole lives. Right, knowing what you know about me from being your brother or you know spouse, um, when you think about us working together, what do you worry about? What excites you? Um, what have we learned from how we've resolved conflicts personally that we can bring into the business? And what have we learned about how we resolve conflicts personally that we definitely want to stay away from in the business? And what are we going to replace it with? Mm-hmm. All things you've got to talk about. The sooner you have these conversations, the less likely you're going to have your business fall apart. That's the theme. That's the takeaway. Right. Have the conversation before you have the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. We will see you on a future podcast. Thanks, Raj. Good to see you.